Hi, in this video we are going to talk about the ethnic conflict in Manipur. We shall discuss the historic, the geographic, the demographic, the political, the insurgency and the social ethnic tensions that are relevant to the Manipur conflict. Let us take a look. Now, in the past set of days, in the last month, we have found that a lot of people have in fact died, tens of thousands have been displaced, Maricom has said, my state is burning. And uh, Pitambar Singh, uh, representative of the Miti community pride, so to say, has said that, uh, you know, there is, the state is moving towards civil war. So, what is happening here? We find the situation is serious. The government of India has, in fact, evoked provisions of Article 355 in the state of Manipur, wherein it has taken over the function of law and order from the state of Manipur to itself. Now, usually this is done as a precursor to evoking Article 356, which is President's rule. But in this case, the government at the center and in the state, both are BJP governments. And in fact, Article 355 has been evoked, but without 356. This is one of those rare cases. And what that does tell us is how serious the situation is. Now, if we take a look at the map, well, of the Northeast, out of the seven sisters, this is Manipur. This is where Manipur is placed on the map. Recently, what has happened is that for the Meiti community, for the Meiti community, the Manipur High Court, a single judge bench, announced a decision that the scheduled tribe status should be accorded to the Meiti status, that the state government should take steps towards that in a time bound manner. Now, you know, we need to examine whether, in fact, the state government can do that because, you know, basically it can't, that that's the central government's prerogative and power and whether the Manipur High Court can advise the government or direct the government to do that within a time-bound manner, the jurisprudence of that is maybe going to be examined by the Supreme Court now subsequently. But as we talk about this issue, we find that this judgment acted as a trigger point wherein subsequently the all tribal students union of manipur organized a protest movement in opposition to this judgment and this is where the violence started to spread from now we want to take a closer look of what happened and why that happened so here we take a look at this map of manipur a large part of the Disturbance and ethnic clashes have happened in Chura Chandpur as well as the Imphal Valley. The Imphal Valley is dominated by the Meti community and Chura Chandpur district is dominated by the Kuki community. Now, why have these clashes happened? Let us take a look by first of all starting with understanding the demography and the geography of the matter. Now, we find that this region here at the heart, known as the valley region, accounts for approximately 10% of the total land area of Manipur. And it accounts for nearly 57% of the total population of Manipur living in this valley region. The Meti community is dominant in the valley region. This remaining region, which is the hill region, has 90% of the land of Manipur and has nearly 42% of the population, which is dominantly tribal. The tribes which are dwelling in the hill region are the Nagas and the Kuki Chin Zomi tribes. The Naga and the Kuki Shin Zomi tribes. These are larger categories. In fact, how communities are classified on the ground can vary and how people self identify can also vary. There are a large number of, in fact, more than 30 tribes that are there on the ground. 
and they are largely classified into these two categories. Now, the issue core, if you're looking at it here, is that here in the valley region, we find that you know the Metis community is dwelling and there is an inner line permit system which is in operation here. An inner line permit system which is in operation here which bars the non-scheduled tribe valley dwellers which is the Metis to go and acquire land in the hill territory or do commercial activities there. And the Métis community is concerned that the population of the tribals has been increasing. Allegedly, they say that multiple of the hill areas, the land is being encroached and that there are allegations or apprehensions that there is poppy cultivation which is happening or drug trade that is happening and that the population also is increasing and that the tribal people are coming and dwelling in the valley area but the people of the valley which is the Métis they are not able to go and live or acquire land in the hill region. This seems to be a primary concern of the Métis community. Now the people who are living in the hills, the tribals, they have a concern that the Métis community which is at the heart of you know the valley here is more prosperous, they are politically more prosperous or, or dominant, let's just say, that the valley sends around 40 MLAs to the otherwise 60 member legislative assembly. And they're dominated by the Métis. The CM also for a lot of decades now has been from the Métis community. So politically they're dominant, economically they're more prosperous than the tribal community. And so the uh, you know, in the, the representation in the government services is also dominant of the Métis community. Nearly 65% of the government jobs are, you know, represented by the Métis community and nearly 35% of the government jobs are, you know, with uh, tribal representation. So, if we take a look at that, the tribals are concerned that the Métis community, which is already dominant, is, you know, is uh, going to further you know, kind of come into the hill region or somehow take over their benefits that they're currently getting, which they see as limited, that they which they get on account of the scheduled tribe status. And if the scheduled tribe status is also now legally extended to the Métis community, then in that case, they would be, you know, not having access to the benefits that they're currently getting, you know, in the same proportion. So this is one of the primary concerns and trigger points so far. Now, if we look at other aspects of demographics here, we see that there are multiple languages being spoken in Manipur, but the primary dominant language is Miti language. And there are multiple religions here. Nearly 41% are Hindus, 41% are Christians, 8.4% are Muslims. Now, the Muslims are also Miti. So, we take a look at this. The Métis community is approximately 53 to 54% of the total population of Manipur. And out of this, there are the Métis Hindus who are Vaishnavite Hindus. And then there are the Métis Pangals, the word Pangal coming from Bangal, Bangal, Bangladesh, that is they are Muslim Metis and then there are the Sanamahi Metis, Sanamahi Metis. So Sanamahi is the traditional religion of the Métis, the historical religion of the Métis before their Hinduization and people who practice the Sanamahi faith are listed separately in the census, there is a separate code for that and uh, they are often you know, ancestor worshippers and nature worshippers and a lot of practices which are otherwise in many ways similar to Hinduism but they have a separate identity and religion and beliefs of their own. Right. So, 
there is the Meti community which is consisting of the Meti Hindus, the Meti Pangals and then there is the Meti Sanamahi which are separate and they have around you know 8.4 percent of the population or 8 percent of the population approximately of Manipur. Now the tribals constitute approximately 40 percent of the population of the state and out of which approximately 24 percent are Naga tribes and 16 percent are Koki tribes. Now this is the demographic distribution of these tribes. So what are the issues that are brewing here? To understand that a little more, we shall take a look at briefly the historical aspect of what has happened. So the state of Manipur derives its name from the Sanskrit word Mani which means jewel. Pur means area. So land of jewel, Manipur was formerly known as the kingdom of Kanglepak which is the Meti term for Manipur. Now, King Loyumba in 1074 had established the kingdom of Kanglepak and the father of Maharaja Garib, Garib Nawaz born Pambhiba, his father had actually first converted to Hinduism and subsequently taking the name Garib Nawaz, King Pamhiba adopted Hinduism with the Vaishnavite belief system as the official religion of the state of Kanglipak. And as such, Hinduism started to spread there. Now, in the tenure of King Chura Chandra, we find that the empire of the princely state of Kangle Park had become a British protectorate and the Britishers in 1907 separated the revenue valley area from the non-revenue hill area on the Assam model introducing now the origin of what is known as the inner line permit system. There was also a separate administrative structure wherein the valley region was governed by the Maharaja himself and the hill region which constitutes nearly 90% of the landmass in Manipur was governed by the president of the state of Manipur Darbar who was like a governor in the British administrative system. So even the governance systems for the hill area and the valley area since 1907 were different. Now, King Bodh Chandra Singh was the last king of Kanglepak princely state and subsequently we find if we take a look at how this came to be after the first Anglo-Manipur war, Manipur became a British protectorate. In 1947, an instrument of accession was signed by the princely state of Kanglepak with the government of India wherein the uh, defense, the foreign affairs and communications was handed over to the government of India and the remaining matters remained with the kingdom of Kanglepak. As such, it was for a brief period of time an independent princely state between 1947 and 1949. In 1949, a merger agreement was signed by the Kingdom, Kingdom of Kangli Park with the government of India and Manipur became a Schedule C or a Part C territory subsequently called a Union Territory. In 1972, Manipur was, Manipur was given full statehood. Now this is a brief history. But however, a lot of people were not happy. 
and this is where we come to the story of insurgency now we find that right starting from the 1950s there was the rise of naga insurgency a lot of different naga groups were demanding greater naga limb an independent country of nagaland where which was confined to the territorial area of not only nagaland but areas of manipur assam and even nearby countries and other territories so this demand was the basis of an insurgency movement led by the nagas one of the prominent groups of this leading this was the naga socialist council of nagaland isac muiva wing nsc and im now as this insurgency grew the government of india in response to this imposed the armed forces special powers act of 1958 in nagaland and in certain regions of manipur now on the other hand we find that meeti groups meeti groups also started to form their own insurgency or revolutionary army groups and prominent among them were the united national liberation force of the metis and the uh, people's revolutionary army of kangle pak both being meeti groups now here their demand was to restore the former state of kangle pak to its original glory as an independent kingdom and they were using insurgency for that they were resisting the merger with the government of india and also simultaneously these meeti groups they were fighting with the naga insurgent groups now in 1993 naga insurgent groups led a massacre against the kuki community and subsequent to that the kukis also started to form their own revolutionary groups so it it gave a momentum to the formation of revolutionary army groups within the kukis themselves kuki revolutionary army being one of the prominent ones now if we take a look at what happened subsequently we see that the there was a tripartite agreement between the center the state and naga socialist council of nagaland isac muiva wing in 1997 so there was a suspension of operations agreement that was signed between central government state government and nsc and im in 2008 the kra along with other in total 24 kuki insurgent groups also signed this suspension of operations agreement between the center and the state and these groups so tripartite agreements however while the hill insurgent groups signed soos the valley insurgent groups led by the metis have till date never signed suspension of operation agreements with the center and the state of manipur as such they technically still remain on war with the government of india now we see that uh, you know lately there has been news that uh, civilians allegedly or others revolutionary armies have raided arms depots and uh, you know civilians have armed themselves now the manner in which the soo operates on the ground is that there are these locations where there are armed cadres and there are these arms depots and one of the keys to those depots is kept by the camp leader and another by the indian armed forces now allegedly uh, you know and on a disputable scale we don't know exactly how many figures but you know a lot of them have been robbed and civilians have armed themselves you know in order to uh, you know fight with whatever other group you know, especially between the conflict between metis and kukis so this is broadly a major idea of the manner in which insurgency is working here however we would also like to acknowledge you know the other role that the insurgents have to play in the daily social political life of manipur while there may be the larger lofty ideals of independent state 
In fact, the KRA also had an original demand for Cookie Land, which was an independent country. But subsequently, now that demand of Cookie Land has been reduced to demand for an independent state within India rather than an independent country. Now, these various different insurgency groups that are operating often back up political candidates. MLAs cutting across party lines have the backing of insurgent groups, and insurgent groups tell people who to vote for. Also, these insurgent groups often levy their own taxes as if running a parallel state there. Apart from that, groups like UNLF have issued dictates which are like strong codes in operation there, wherein uh, Indian movies or music, uh, you know, Hindi movies and music has been banned. And plus, there is banning on alcohol or Indian dresses to be worn there in Manipur. So they are controlling various different aspects of daily life as well. There are, apart from that, allegations that multiple of these groups may be engaging in poppy cultivation and, uh, you know, drug business. Now, coming to the essential issue that we have raised here, that amongst various different issues, one of the important issue here, here is that uh, the ST status which the Manipur High Court has directed the Manipur state government to expedite, right, in you know, in according this status to the Meiti community, let us examine on what basis this ST status is given. Article 342 of the Constitution of India dealing with this basically tells us that the President of India has the authority, has the power as a jurisdiction to notify a tribe as a scheduled tribe. And the Parliament of India has the authority to modify such a list, meaning remove the name of a tribe from the list of scheduled tribes. So the procedure to add the name is, a, is an executive procedure and the procedure to remove the name is a legislative procedure. What this article does not mention and is otherwise not mentioned in the Constitution of India is that on what grounds should such addition or removal be done which has been more of a matter of convention and according to convention the grounds which have been established till date for deciding you know whether a tribe should be listed as a scheduled tribe or not are things like geographical isolation geographical isolation shyness of contact economic backwardness and unique culture. So these four criteria are the ones which are usually used by convention to decide whether a tribe should be listed as a scheduled tribe or not. Now in the case of the Métis community, they are living in the valley area, not in isolation in hills. They and you know they are kind of the mainstream population who is who are also politically and economically otherwise you know progressive or dominant, right? Uh, and as such, whether these criteria do apply to them, right, or not, right? This is a matter which is subjudice. You now the court may still yet decide, and you know we'll see how the court comes around with regards to the interpretation of this matter. But this is with regards to the core issue of scheduled tribes and on what basis usually we you know, allocate this status of scheduled tribes. Now, to conclude, we find that while this issue has been quite hot burning, potentially the issue seems to be about developmental disparity and various different apprehensions that people have. Obviously, there are certain disinformation campaigns that have also been run. But at the heart, if you look at it, the valley region is more prosperous. It has, you know, the people living there have more access to government jobs. The bulk of the foreign tourist and the domestic tourist also go into the valley area. And also, we find that, you know, with regards to institutional deliveries or access to safe drinking water or electricity or other facilities and amenities, which together add up to human development index progresses are better in the valley in contrast to the hill region. 
so we find that the solution moving forward while to the sc status it is a subjudice matter and we'll see how the court you know opines on this but the essential resolution to the issues that we are looking at between various different people in the short term obviously a lot of good law and order and confidence building measures but in the medium term they do require addressing the genuine concerns of developmental disparity in all the communities with mutual assurances maybe some assurances on the manner of inner line permit system and as well the welfare system that it is going to function very well ensuring everybody is equally treated this is our medium to long term solution to ensure that such strife does not happen again thank you class